sägs att många infektioner börjar och drabbar andningsorganen. Men vad är det som egentligen händer vid till exempel luftvägsinfektioner och varför drabbas vissa av andningssvårigheter från allergi och astma? Innan vi reder ut dessa frågor så får vi börja med att förklara hur andningen fungerar i kroppen och hur luftens väg till lungorna och blodet är. At the top of the respiratory system, the nostrils bring air into the nose where it's filtered, warmed and moistened. Tiny hairs called cilia protect the nasal passageways and other parts of the respiratory tract and filter out dust and other particles that enter the nose through the breathed air. Air can also be breathed in through the mouth. The two airways of the nose and mouth meet up at the pharynx, which is located at the back of the throat. The pharynx carries both food and air and is used for digestion and respiration. One path is for food. This is called the esophagus, which leads on to the stomach. The other side is for air. It's called the trachea. A small flap of tissue, called the epiglottis, covers the air-only passage when we swallow. This stops food and liquid from going into the lungs. The larynx, or voice box, is located at the top of the trachea, the air-only pipe. This is where our vocal cords are. The trachea, or windpipe, which is a two to three centimeter tube, then extends downwards from the bottom of the larynx for about 12 centimeters. The walls of the windpipe are made strong by stiff rings of cartilage that keep it open. The trachea is also lined with tiny hairs. They sweep foreign particles and fluids out of the airway, keeping them from entering the lungs. The windpipe divides into two branches, and each one of these enters one of the two lungs of the body. Each branch resembles the limbs of a tree dividing into smaller, finer branches called bronchioles. The bronchioles end in tiny air sacs called alveoli, which look a bit like grapes. These structures enable fresh air to get to the air sacs, which are surrounded by tiny blood vessels, or capillaries. The oxygen passes through these air sacs and travels through the capillary walls into the bloodstream. At the same time, carbon dioxide transfers from the bloodstream into the air sacs, where it gets breathed out of the body. There are many common infections that are affected or start in the bloodstream. Detta då bakterier och virus lätt kan ta sig in i kroppen genom att följa med inandningsluften. Hals- och luftrörsinfektioner är det vanligaste andningsbesvären och luftrörskatarr, som även kallas eh, akut bronkit, är en sådan sjukdom. Den orsakas oftast av en virusinfektion som får slemhinnorna i luftrören att svullna upp och producera mer slem än vanligt. Slemhinnorna fungerar annars som ett skydd mot inkräktare genom att smittoämnen som fastnar attackeras av celler från immunförsvaret. Luftvägarnas förmåga att skydda sig mot dessa infektioner kan bland annat försvagas av tobaksrökning. Man brukar skilja på obstruktiva och restriktiva lungsjukdomar. Obstruktiva sjukdomar minskar flödet i andningsvägarna och gör det svårt att andas, medan restriktiva lungsjukdomar minskar själva lungvolymen. Let's start with restrictive. And this just describes the fact that the lungs, which are supposed to expand when you take air in to make room for the air, for some reason it's not expanding properly. So this is an intake inspiration problem. And since oxygen is the main point of taking air in, in restrictive diseases we lack oxygen. So what happens is the lungs, for a variety of reasons, become stiff and hard to blow up like a balloon that's been dipped in paper mache and it can't blow up properly. So if you look at if this is supposed to be the size of the lung when it's blown up, this smaller lung here in restrictive disease gives us a lot of wasted space. All the space that could have had oxygen but is now not usable. That just makes the whole system less efficient, right? So there's something wrong with the actual structure of the lungs that's making it hard to expand. So. Let's think of some examples. So there's um, fibrosis. Fibrosis just means laying down too much scar tissue. So if the lungs are chronically injured or sometimes there's a genetic factor to it, the tissue gets stiff. Just like a scar you would have on your hand, except you have it all over your lungs. So it's not no longer expandable. There are also things that can affect the chest wall. Um, say if there's muscular diseases that make it hard for the chest to expand, that also limits how big the lungs can get. Or sometimes there could be things that are deposited in the actual tissue of the lungs. I can think of amyloidosis. 
which is these protein particles that get studded into the lungs, making it harder ex to expand. So those are our examples of restrictive disease. Oxygen, ca oxygen cannot get in. Now it's evil twin, or I guess they're both evil, but its counterpart would be obstructive disease. Obstructive. So if we said before that restrictive is about not getting air in, then the opposite would be not getting air out. In restrictive diseases, we're having trouble with expiration. So instead of letting the lungs collapse back to its normal size at the end of an exhale, it, it stays expanded like this. Let me just draw some of the branches here just to show you. There are different reasons that obstructive diseases can occur. Sometimes, let's say there's a mucus plug and air can get out. Or sometimes this airway is collapsed because the walls have lost its elastic quality structure. So the air is essentially stuck in there. Let's think of all this extra air. You imagine how difficult it would be if you cannot exhale. That's very uncomfortable. So obstructive disease describes these large overinflated lungs. Now some examples would be something you've probably heard of as COPD, which is actually a group of two different diseases. One is emphysema, which have to do with the lungs losing their elastic quality. And the other one is chronic bronchitis, which is just a lot of irritation day in and day out that makes a lot of mucus. And both of these result in these large inflated lungs. Something more common that a lot of people have is asthma, which is when the airways spasm and they close up, blocking the air from getting out. So restrictive and obstructive diseases kind of have to do with the global picture of the lung. Not to get into too much of the detail, just think of restrictive as having trouble getting air in, oxygen in, and obstructive having trouble getting carbon dioxide out with the exhale. Asthma är en obstruktiv lungsjukdom där luftrören inflammeras och smullar upp. Vid ett astmanfall krampar de glatta musklerna runt luftrören och drar ihop sig. Luftvägarna blir mindre och det blir svårare och tyngre att andas. Dessutom utsöndras extra mycket slem från slemhinnorna, vilket bidrar till slemhosta. Att man anstränger sig för att andas gör att kroppen förbrukar mer syre och bildar mer koldioxid. Och i väldigt svår astma kan man därför få annöd och syrebrist. Kol är en annan obstruktiv sjukdom som är förkortning för kronisk obstruktiv lungsjukdom och orsakar att lungornas elasticitet minskar i och med att alveolerna gradvis kollapsar då väggarna skadas och förstörs. Detta gör så att syrupptagningsförmågan försämras samt så att det blir svårare att ventilera lungorna och andas då luftrören inte bärs upp. Luftrören är som vid astma inflammerade och trånga och slemhosta är väldigt vanligt. Till skillnad från kol så har sällan personer med astmaproblem med andningen hela tiden. Detta skiljer sig dock från person till person. Allergisk astma utlöses oftast på grund av allergi, medan icke-allergisk astma utlöses vid inandning av irriterande ämnen, virus eller vid ansträngning. En person med astma har därför ofta fullt fungerande lungor när inget anfall sker. Detta till skillnad från kol som utvecklas långsamt och till slut bidrar till permanent nedsättning och andningsproblem och är vanlig hos tobaksrökare. Detta är alltså två olika sjukdomar med liknande symptom där man brukar höra att svår kol eller astma är som att andas genom ett sugrör.